The Russ Belleville Show is intended for responsible adults only. We advocate to the repeal of marijuana prohibition for adults. We discuss the science, culture, and controversy about America's marijuana laws. We do not advocate any illegal activity and encourage all listeners to learn their state and federal marijuana laws. Opinions and claims made by guests and advertisers on the Russ Belleville Show are their own, and the Russ Belleville Show cannot be held legally responsible for their validity or reliability. Viewer discretion is advised. The Prohibition Opposition Television Network, brought to you by the National Cannabis Coalition. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you dry it, you roll it, you smoke it. And it goes down smooth. Hey! Spanning the continent to bring you the truth about cannabis and marijuana law reform. I smoke pot and I like it a lot. From the promise of legalization. To the agony of prohibition. One major responsibility is to encourage people to use less drugs. The Prohibition Opposition Television Network presents The Rough Belleville Show, the voice of the marijuana nation. Now, here's your host, Radical Rough Belleville. Oh, yeah, welcome to the middle of the week, folks. It is Thursday, June 7th, 2012, and it's got to be 420 somewhere in the world. Boy, do we have plenty of stuff to cover in the next two hours. I'm glad you could join me here uh, to get it all covered. And, of course, joining us here in the studio on camera, too, we have the pirate himself, Ganja John, hanging out. How you What's doing, up, John? Russ? I did not adjust my camera, so I'm leaning over kind of funny. <laughs> Just pull the whole mic that way, and the camera will go with it. Oh, yeah. So we got Ganja John here. How are things going in Ganja John land? They're going good. Ganja wife got back into town last night after being gone for eight days. So we just had lunch. Oh, and, uh, fantastic. Had a good time. Glad to hear it. Also joining us from our virtual studio in Grastoria, Oregon, we have our news director, Cannabis Carrie. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Russ. Hi, Gonja John. How are you guys doing today? Doing fantastic. I'm, I'm loving hearing the uh, Daily Cannabis Chronicle every day. We replay it uh, at the top of every hour, just like a, a real network news station. And uh, Carrie, thank you for doing those uh, headlines for us. Sure, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. I, I like the new format. I'm digging it, man. All right, well, what do we have in the news today? Today, big news day, I think, anyway. First of all, uh, Senator Kerry, you remember Senator Kerry from Nebraska. He kind of makes a statement about national medical marijuana. We also have a California court ruling about the American with Disabilities Act and whether or whether that doesn't cover medical marijuana patients. But the big news today, Eric Holder was held under the fire today and questioned about the dispensary raids and the Fast and Furious uh, program. We're going to give you his answers first up on today's Cannabis Chronicles. All right, we'll take a look at that. That. Also coming up on today's show, we've got our Groovin' Thursday Daily Toker Tunes. And uh, Ganja John, you got a tune for us today? Are you looking one up? I am looking one up. We have a few podcast, pod safe artists that we can use, so I'm just kind of I'm picking one on the fly today. It'll be a surprise for all of us. All right, fantastic. Good to hear it. And uh, also coming up on today's show, uh, we are going to be visiting with Titus Peterson. He's a former lead felony prosecutor in Denver, Colorado. He's with Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, and uh, he is going to be talking about his experiences uh, prosecuting marijuana crimes and why he says now legalize all drugs. It'll be a great discussion. And then at the end of the show, I've got time for a radical rant. We're going to talk a little bit about the uh, article that I briefly touched on in uh, hour two yesterday. Ches Pazienza was writing in the Huffington Post a piece called Reefer Madness, and he was referring to a CNN contributor, both of whom are saying that those of us who are fighting for marijuana legalization uh, need to take a reality check, that it's not the most important issue in the world, and that all we really want to do is get high. I'm going to give you my opinions on that. And actually, uh, Chaz responded to my response in the Huffington Post. I posted my blog in the Huffington Post this morning. He's already responded to it. And uh, so I'll go back and forth between the two posts and uh, give you my take on the issue. Uh, also, we'll be taking it into Hour 2, Toker Talk Radio, where we'll take your calls at 971-533-7111. We are sponsored by the National Cannabis Coalition. You can find out more at National 
CannabisCoalition.com. And you can text Russ to 42420 to show your support for this show on our new sponsor, the National Cannabis Coalition. Coming up next week, we should be ad-free on live stream and coming to you from a brand new high-def platform. So we'll give you more details on that in hour two as well. Stick around. We are going to be right back after these messages. You're listening to The Russ Belville Show on RadicalRuss.com. Visit our Facebook page at The Russ Belville Show. back after these messages from our 420 friendly sponsors support these advertisers because their ad money goes straight to the rust belleville show you're tuned into the rust belleville show the voice of the marijuana nation brought to you by the national cannabis coalition it's simply business it's simply business. It's simply business. You know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. It's simply business. You know why they won't let us grow. It's simply business. Help us legalize it. Text NCC to 42420 and send 10 bucks to the National Cannabis Coalition. The Russ Belleville Show. Providing dictionaries to drug czars since 2009. Ganja John, freaking out stoner comedian since 2011. Medical marijuana, industrial hemp, ganja sacrament, consumer cannabis. The topic of marijuana is heating up the news, and the Russ Belleville Show catches you up with today's latest headlines. Now, here's our senior news editor, Cannabis Carey, with the Daily Cannabis Chronicle. Today, United States Attorney General Eric Holder said that the Obama administration is only targeting dispensaries that have exceeded state laws and that he's still trying to find accountability in the errors under Operation Fast and Furious. Attorney General Holder was in a House Judiciary Committee oversight hearing this morning when he told committee members, quote, we limit our enforcement efforts to those individual organizations that are acting out of conformity with state law. That response was an answer to Representative Gerald Nadler from New York, who was questioning Holder about the administration administration's medical marijuana policies. Representative Nadler has sponsored a medical marijuana bill in the state of New York. And during his 2008 campaign, Obama promised to make marijuana use a lower priority and not to waste government resources prosecuting medical marijuana cases. When the first few DEA raids happened during his tenure, the White House said it was just a holdover from the previous administration's policies. In October of 2009, the Holder Memo was put out to provide clarification and guidance to federal prosecutors in medical marijuana states. It asked them to not focus on individuals using medical marijuana in compliance with existing state laws. The memo also stated that, quote, prosecution of commercial enterprises that unlawfully market and sell marijuana for profit continues to be an enforcement priority of the department. Now, activists and entrepreneurs interpreted that memo to mean that if they were following state laws, they would not be targeted by federal authorities. That has not been the case. Holder said that the recent raids in Colorado and California were because the uh, medical marijuana district distribution centers were near schools. Now, Holder was also pressured about Operation Fast and Furious, a program where DEA agents were letting weapons freely move across the U.S.-Mexican border called gun walking in hopes of pinning future charges on drug gang leaders. He was answering to the charge by committee chairman Lamar Smith that the Obama administration had, quote, shown a disregard for the U.S. Constitution and the rule of law in an effort to impose their agenda on the American people. Smith said that efforts to block congressional inquiries about the administration's action in Operation Fast and Furious are an attempt to hide those responsible for the decisions that led to the death of Border Patrol agent Brian Terry by a rifle purchased with knowledge under the Fast and Furious operation. He also accused the Justice Department of refusing to comply with congressional subpoenas to find out why the program was ever authorized and who had knowledge of the inappropriate tactics. Holder and Congressman Daryl Issa had a heated exchange about the Fast and Furious program this morning. Issa and others are wanting more 
more accountability over just who authorized this dangerous and ultimately deadly plan. The Justice Department has admitted to having over 140,000 internal documents that reference the operation, but they have only handed over 7,600 of them to a congressional investigator. You know, uh, I was a talk radio host on XM Satellite during the waning years of the Bush administration. And I remember liberals and progressives and uh, people who would otherwise consider themselves to be left of center railing against President George W. Bush for some of the things he did during his administration. But strangely, I find those people are silent when we start talking about Operation Fast and Furious and some of the other uh, actions of the Obama administration. I'll come back to Fast and Furious in just a second. I want to get to that first point where uh, Holder now, Attorney General Holder, wants to make the excuse that, oh, we're only going after these dispensaries in uh, these medical marijuana states where they're not complying with state law. Well, gosh, where where is that in the Constitution, uh, Mr. Holder, where the federal government has the right to decide whether state laws are being followed? I, I, I was looking at the Constitution all day today, and I forgot that clause. I, I, I forget whether it's in Article 1, Article 2. Where that? Where is that at, Attorney General Holder? I mean, you are the Attorney General. You ought to know. Uh, can you point me to that part of the Constitution that says the Attorney General's Office of the Federal Government of the United States of America is in charge of deciding whether or not some guy running a dispensary in, in, uh, in Los Angeles or in Helena, Montana or in Seattle, Washington is properly following uh, his or her state laws? Because I don't believe that's in the Constitution, Mr. Attorney General. I believe you're deciding on your own what you think are the violations of state laws rather than letting the states tell you that. That excuse might wash if, say, the Attorney General of California or Montana had contacted your office and said, please, federal government, DEA, help us out. These guys here running this dispensary are violating state law. But that's not happened. That has not happened. It's still being discussed. After 16 years in California, they're still trying to figure out what exactly is legal or illegal under state law. But you want to come down from the federal uh, level with your thugs and decide for them what is uh, violating state law or not. And it's mainly just because you don't like the idea of people other than your friends and big pharma making money off of the sale of drugs. Like any good drug dealer, you're just trying to protect your turf. Now, back to this Fast and Furious thing. This scandal, I'm telling you, if this had happened under the Bush administration, there'd be liberals, uh, progressives out front of the White House daily protesting this. This is the federal government knowingly allowing Mexican drug-running criminals to purchase weapons in America while the gun store owners were saying, uh... Gosh, uh, are you sure you want us to sell to these guys? I mean, gee, uh, doesn't sound like a good idea to us. And them being reassured, no, no, go ahead and sell them the guns. We want you to sell them the guns. We're going to follow the guns into Mexico and find out where they end up so we can bust these guys on drug char- on, on gun charges. And, of course, they lose track of where the guns go, except for the fact that one of them turns up in a killing of an American Border Patrol officer. And now the Obama administration is playing CYA, cover your ass as much as it can to try to avoid the scandal that it rightfully deserves to be pinned on Eric Holder's department. There's only two excuses for this. Either you didn't know what was going on, in which case you are incompetent, ineffective, and a poor manager and leader, or you did know what was going on, in which case you show shockingly bad judgment and and, and a lack of knowledge of our constitutional and treaty obligations to the sovereign country of Mexico. Either way, Eric Holder has got to go. A court case out of California delivers a blow to medical marijuana patients in the state hoping to get some legal protection over obtaining their preferred medication. A panel of three judges in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in San Francisco has ruled that the Americans with Disability Act does not protect the rights of disabled patients who are using medical marijuana, even if they are doing so under a doctor's care. The case was James versus the city of Costa Mesa, and it stemmed from a lawsuit filed by four severely disabled California residents of Costa Mesa and Lake Forest, California. They tried to sue the city that restricted dispensaries and made it impossible to get their medical marijuana. Many communities, including Costa Mesa and Lake Forest, have passed city ordinances that ban the sale of medical marijuana. Now, in defiance of the ban, several medical marijuana dispensaries remained open for years, but were more recently the subject of raids and closures, as well as an increasing amount of pressure from some citizens to enforce the ban and close any and all dispensaries in their area. Now, the four plaintiffs in the case sued, claiming they have the protection 
violation of the a, uh, the ADA since the closure would mean that they would lose their source of medical marijuana. Title II of the ADA prohibits discrimination in the provision of public services to any qualified individual with a disability. The plaintiffs contend that the cities are in violation of the act based on their actions. The judges ruled in a split decision two to one that they did not have such protection in their ruling. They stated, quote, we recognize that the plaintiffs are gravely ill and that their request for ADA relief implicates not only their right to live comfortably, but also their basic human dignity. We also acknowledge that California has embraced marijuana as an effective treatment for individuals like the plaintiffs who face debilitating pain. Congress has made it clear, however, that the ADA defines illegal drug use by reference to federal rather than state law, and federal law does not authorize the plaintiff's medical marijuana use. We therefore necessarily conclude that the patient's medical marijuana use is not protected by the ADA. Yeah, unfortunately, this is a well-worn path that's been tried in Washington, in Oregon, in California in the state court level. Now that it's made it to the federal court level, we're getting exactly the same answer. Yes, we absolutely know that you're sick. Yes, you absolutely shouldn't be discriminated against because you're using medicine to treat your sickness. Yes, we recognize that California and these other states have come up with a way of treating marijuana as medicine and recognizing its medicinal use lawfully by its citizens. But unfortunately, the federal government still says... Drugs are bad. You shouldn't do drugs. Uh, If you do them, you're bad. Because drugs are bad, okay? So it really doesn't matter what we say as far as the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, Americans with Disabilities Act, federal law, marijuana, federally illegal drug. End of discussion. It doesn't matter how good our arguments are in the federal courts so long as the Controlled Substances Act mistakenly places marijuana in Schedule 1 alongside of heroin and PCP. Uh, we've seen this in Oregon. In the case in Oregon, when they tried to uh, press the ADA issue, a very interesting decision here came down in the Oregon courts that basically said, well, because you use cannabis and when you use cannabis, it makes you not as disabled, then you can't use the ADA. Because your treatment of it is like wearing eyeglasses. When you wear eyeglasses, the condition you have that makes you disabled, not being able to see, is remedied by the eyeglasses. So when you put the eyeglasses on, you're not disabled anymore. That's the actual argument our Oregon courts made when denying ADA relief to the patients here who are lawfully using marijuana as medicine. So once again, it just shows how pernicious this prohibition is and how far into our lives it reaches in every different way. We'll talk more about that during the Radical Rant. We'll also bring it into our two discussions. And Democrat Bob Kerry says it's time the nation considered allowing doctors to prescribe medical marijuana. That's right, the nation, especially to returning veterans with mental health issues. While Senator Kerry said he doesn't support full legalization of marijuana, Kerry says he does believe that returning veterans who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder or other mental trauma should be allowed to use marijuana as long as their doctors agreed it would help alleviate their symptoms. Kerry said at the very least, the Department of Veterans Affairs should be allowed to study whether cannabis could help veterans returning from combat as anecdotal evidence shows. Senator Kerry would also like the conflicts between state and federal laws to be addressed. He said it might be time to explore the option of having the Food and Drug Administration rather than the Drug Enforcement Administration be the regulator of marijuana. But to clarify, he said that under no circumstances is he talking about legalizing marijuana to the point it can be purchased over the counter on street corners. Now, he was questioned by reporters over his friendship with billionaire Peter Lewis, who has given massive amounts of money to try and get marijuana legalized. Kerry said that the friendship does not mean he supports legalization, that he has never advised Lewis on their efforts to pass any pro-cannabis laws. Now, Kerry is running for the U.S. State Senate against Republican Deb Fisher. His views on marijuana have been raised and speculated on by Republicans, while his home state of Nebraska is mounting a legalization effort. Supporters are collecting signatures for a bill to legalize marijuana for private, non-commercial use in Nebraska, but it needs about 120,000 signatures by July 6th to make that ballot. Nebraska does not currently recognize medical marijuana as a legal option for medical therapy. Well, folks, you know what I've always said. Uh, If you can carry a gun in the sand, you should have a joint in your hand, right? Any veteran coming back from serving our country, it should just be no your DD-214 form. That should be your medical marijuana card, right? If you've gotten honorable discharge from the military anywhere in the United States, you should not be prosecuted for use of marijuana. I would think that's the least we can do for the people that put their lives on on the line to protect our American freedoms. Uh, That said, I always find it weird when people like uh, Bob Carey will recognize the uh, medical use of marijuana for PTSI, 
By the way, I don't call it PTSD anymore. I call it PTSI, post-traumatic stress injury. There is no disorder for your brain reacting the way it does when it's gone through a traumatic event like the horrors of war or, or being raped or attacked or something like that. It's a post-traumatic stress injury. You're not disordered. You're acting perfectly rationally for someone who suffered through that horror. But it always cracks me up when, when they say, oh, well, our vets, you know, we should study it for our vets who are coming home. They suffered in war and might do some good for them. But by God, we can't let that same person, if they haven't gone to war, buy a, a, a bag of buds over the counter, right? You, you have to have suffered. There has to be something wrong with you before we'll allow you to use marijuana. You have to have gone through war. You have to have cancer. You have to have AIDS. Something terribly wrong has had to happen to you. But we are here to tell you with National Cannabis Coalition and the Russ Belville Show that there doesn't have to be anything wrong with you to use marijuana. There just has to be something right with you to use. It's 420 back in Idaho where Russ and Carrie were born. So we have to go uh, connect with our roots. You know what I mean? Please support these sponsors who support the Russ Belleville Show. All right, when we come back, we got some Daily Toker tunes. Ganja John's going to pull up some music for us. And uh, we'll also talk about some future shows coming up on Thursday nights. A big announcement from Big Daddy Fink. All that and more coming up on the Russ Bell Bell Show. Stick around. We'll be right back after this. No, you talking to that reefer man. The law offices of Omar Figueroa would like to remind you to stand up for your rights. Please do not give up your precious liberties. There's nothing wrong with standing up for our constitutional rights, and in fact, it's the only way to honor the Constitution that recognizes our natural rights. Treat law enforcement with respect and respect the Constitution by standing up for your rights. If you are detained or arrested, stand up for your rights by repeating, I respectfully invoke all my legal and constitutional rights. I do not consent to any search and seizure. I want to remain silent, and I want to speak to my attorney, Omar Figueroa. Omar Figueroa has more than a decade of experience in federal and California courts and graduated from Yale University, Stanford Law School, and Trial Lawyers College. Please contact the law offices of Omar Figueroa at 415-489-0420 or 707-829-0215 or on the web at www.omarfigueroa.com. Net brings you the best in daily toker tunes every weekday. Each day features a different genre, including Roots Monday, Folks, here's a story about Mindy Electric Tuesday, <laughs> Irie Wednesday, Summer Ganja Planta, Call Me the Ganja Ruben Thursday, Do you wanna get high? and Rock Friday. Then on weekends, we mix them all together in our weekend music party. Check potnet.us for airtimes. Everyone knows music and marijuana go together, so let's wind up our 20 after break with the Russ Belleville Show's Daily Toker Tunes, the best in pod safe 420 music from around the web. Today is Groovin' Thursday, featuring rap, hip hop, soul, and funk music. You can get downloads and more information about all our daily Tucker tunes by visiting music.radicalrust.com. Now, sit back and enjoy your daily Tucker tunes. All right. Welcome back, everybody, and uh, time for some Daily Toker tunes to get your smoke on, too. We turn things over to Ganja John, the host of the Ganja John Show. So uh, we got some permission from uh, Hieroglyphics and all of the uh, artists who are in Hieroglyphics to play any of their music. That includes Del the Funky Home Oh, Sapien, yeah! Who uh, many of you may know as Ice-T's cousin, the dude who sang in the, that Gorillaz song. Or uh, this song you may remember from, I think it was Tony Hawk Pro Skater 4 is where I first heard it. Oh, yeah, video and, game music. Uh, yeah, yeah. So uh, without further ado, this is Del the Funky Homo Sapien with If You Must.
It's important to practice good hygiene. At least if you wanna run with my team, I'm about to get into some shit that I've seen. This fool's breath on me, so that'll melt your ice cream. They say don't say nothing if you just say nice things. Sitting too close to him on board like my ice thing. I tried to be subtle, hand him a stick of gum. I was a victim of breath on him. Running his yap about what set he from. Gotta get some gum, gotta get him some. He turned it down, his teeth was brown. It's cruciating for and it was a new sensation. I had to ask the dope to pass the soap. Cause his coat had to slip the crustaceans. Or bathrooms in the bus station. He had a can of OE and some raisins. Amazing. Head to Tobio, he didn't know. Used to the fragrance. Just as the days went without bathing. He felt manly and not like a maiden. He had one dread and fungus. Said he worked on people's toilets with plungers. Girls, not the guy you would want the tongue, yeah. So guys, take your cue from this little number. You gotta wash your ass. If you must, you gotta wash your hair. If you must, you gotta wash your teeth. If you must, or else you'll be funky. You gotta wash your ass. If you must, you gotta wash your hair. If you must, you gotta wash your teeth. If you must, or else you'll be funky. Now in class you need total concentration But there's kids in the back holding conversations Cracking on each other And neither were poster boys Both of them smell like the type that's over boy Coast and joy to leave an absence One food he smelled like his drunk some matchsticks Brimstone Girls would never bring him home I was laughing Then his friend raised his tone and said yeah. I go so deep on your ass, you'll be submerged Like you need to do it in water, cause you smell like a turd Wanna count, get some courage, your feet smell lurid Go to get up, and while you at it, get a cup and squeeze the sweat out your sweatshirt And drink it or gargle, you get all close for most stinkiest That nigga started thinking of shit, said I was frail I said he was stale, under arms is right, under garments white About to leap out your holy sweats, then we hold him best And after this I'm gonna collect, nigga check yourself, respect yourself and wash a motherfucking body for your sweatshirt melt like radio active no lady find you attractive the folks got you captive you don't need a map bitch mm. That's Del the Funky. So, homies, ha, hard to say. That's Del the Funky Homo Sapien for our Groovin' Thursday team. When we come back, we're speaking with Titus Peterson from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Stick around. time to pick up a copy of the official High Times Cannabis Cookbook, published by the world's most trusted name when it comes to getting stoned. Packed tight with more than 50 recipes for iry appetizers, munchy meals, high holidays, stoner sweets, and cannabis cocktails, along with expert advice that demystifies the experience of infusing marijuana into butter, alcohol, and various oils. This book will get you cooking with grass in no time, with special treats inspired by Willie Nelson, Snoop Dogg, and Cheech and Chong, plus all the info you need to stay safe when making and consuming edibles. You will truly learn how to bake a ganja cake and eat it too. So look for the official High Times Cannabis Cookbook wherever finer books The Cure with Georgia and Amy. Responsible talk about ending prohibition, courtesy of iCannabisRadio.com. Cannaboids and health. Cannabinoids. 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 Why am I having trouble saying that? Cannabinoids. <laughs> oh, jeez. Cannabinoids. Oh, uh, what a gift. Flame on, flame on if you can. You're looking for the dope weed. Fire it up. Flame on, flame on if you can. You're looking for the dope weed. Pony boy's a man. Flame on, flame on if you can. You're looking for the dope weed. Flame on, flame on. Get the light off. If you burn blood. The rush.
Ross Belleville Show reminds you to never smoke and drive impaired. Hang out for a while and share. Because the day was hard and your work was long and you need a break from all that's wrong. You better look at the clock because it's 419. Time to reach in that pocket for your bag of green and smoke that weed. You're tuned smoke into the Rush Belleville Show. One of the most disturbing elements of the Prohibition War is how it's made police the enemy of otherwise law-abiding cannabis consumers. Fortunately, one group of police officers knows the futility of Prohibition and reaches out to educate the community and current law enforcement. Today, the Russ Belleville Show visits with another speaker from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition with one clear message. Cops say legalize drugs. All right, welcome back, everybody. Radical Russ here coming to you from Rolla J Studios in Potland, Oregon. And uh, on the first and third Thursdays, we've switched it. On the first and third Thursdays, we bring you Cops Say Legalize Drugs, which is uh, speakers from law enforcement against prohibition, former prosecutors, attorneys, uh, police, prison guards, etc., judges, and so on, who all have decided that the war on drugs and that the prohibition war here is a failure and it needs to end. And they have got a great speakers bureau. You can find them by going to leap.cc. They have speakers all over the United States and, in fact, some international speakers as well. So if you need someone for your event uh, to explain uh, about the prohibition war and why we need to legalize drugs and somebody who comes to it from a law enforcement background that's virtually unassailable from our opposition's point of view, contact Leap at leap.cc or copsaylegalizedrugs.com. Joining us by telephone to talk about the need to legalize drugs is Titus Peterson. He is a former felony prosecutor in Denver, Colorado. Titus, welcome to the Russ Belville Show. Hello, how are you? Ah, doing really good. So glad to have you here. And uh, we, we understand that you're uh, fairly new to LEAP, just joined the organization. And what was it uh, in your career that convinced you that the uh, Prohibition War was a failure and you needed to speak up with LEAP? Well, there's just a lot of different things. Uh, you know, as you were talking, I was remembering this one conference they had where they gathered all the prosecutors from all over Colorado. And they had this speaker talking about how we all needed to really close ranks and support the war on drugs because at this point it was uh... things were falling to pieces in columbia um, and that you know there were people dying because of uh... the drug uh... consumption here and i just sat there and saw this scary guy running around saying these things and thinking Wow, the reason why everybody's getting killed is because we are making this illegal. And it was as if it was as if the crazy people were in charge and anybody who would say anything, I mean every the, the entire audience there were probably 2000 of us there and everybody was terrified to say anything in the face of this wild emperor who was marching up and down rabid foaming at the mouth about this. And yet you know, I just knew he didn't make any sense and that, you know, we were fighting such vast amounts of ignorance. But where this goes really is, you know, I ran my own office. I wasn't the elected DA. I was the appointed DA for a county um, in ski country, Colorado. And we were making money, really, that, that was how we funded our office, by supporting the war on drugs and we had people who wrote grants and people who administered them and people who went out to talk to kids in the schools and it was like a religion it was it was the state supporting this um you know this kind of craziness and you know it was all self-serving um you know the people got elected got elected on it and then you know we all supported that and so you know i just began to really feel as if um you know, this whole thing had to stop, and you know, I'm just thankful for Leap because I have felt alone for many years, as if there's no place really to talk about this. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, I'm really thankful for that, and I'm thankful for you because 
you know, the word needs to get out. I mean, whether you're, you know, somebody who doesn't like big government, I, I think there's a place for you under the let's end the drug war, or you're somebody who believes that these are shamanic substances and that they have the right to do something with their own body, um, that, that they, that it's their body, um, Mm -hmm. that those people also, uh, support it. So I feel like, you know, somehow there needs to be this sort of closing of ranks across the political spectrum around this issue, and and we could move forward. And and I maybe I'm a bit of a uh, I believe in utopia, but I, I think that things would really begin to change in society with that sort of uh, whether it's you know the size of government or the attitudes that people have about each other. If if the uh, you know the the war on drugs came to an end. So mm. you know so you anyway, mentioned that's, that's my 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 thing in a, in a bottle. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and, and you short, mentioned so. something that's very compelling to me in in talking about how <laughs> you're in a room with you know hundreds or thousands of of fellow law enforcers, and there's that uh, there's that culture of you know go along to get along, you know you know don't rock the boat, uh, be a good soldier, that kind of feeling in there that prevents officers and and law enforcers and prosecutors from speaking out when they can see with their own damn eyes. You know what's going on here with this uh, prohibition war. So, so what do you think is the biggest thing that's blocking them from making, from speaking out and making a change here? Um, you know, I think it it was fear for me. I mean, I sat there and felt as if I couldn't really speak up, um, and I don't know why I felt so disempowered there, but I felt as if it would affect my career or. I would be looked down upon or I would be singled out or maybe, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, it was, it had a, a, a definite feeling of a witch hunt to it where, you know, similar to, you know, the, in the times of the pilgrims or whatever, mm-hmm. where, you know, you know, there's craziness going on, but somehow you don't want to be the one to, to point it out because they might point the finger at you or something. I mean, it, it had that mm-hmm. feeling to it. Um, and I do think there's a lot of money involved in the war on drugs. I, I you know, I don't want to underestimate that. And then, uh, you know, I can't tell you how much money we got in our own office. So to begin to talk against it was to maybe attack some of the funding that your office mm-hmm. got. Um, and I think that goes through everything. I mean, here in Colorado, the governor tried to shut down one prison, just one prison, because we don't need all the prisons we have. And he couldn't do that. Mm. And so... I have to think that on some level, there's a group of people who sort of unite under this uh, umbrella of let's control what everybody else does with their body, whether it be um, reproductive rights or gay rights or who you can marry or what you can do, that those people combine with the people who need to lock people up for not conforming. Um, because that's what their livelihood is, and and that somehow they they sort of intuitively know each other, and then, but I don't, you know, I don't, I, I'm really at a sort of a loss. I mean, I'm trying to figure all this out myself as I get older. I'm like, what is, what is the deal with everybody needing to control everybody else? Why can't they just be happy controlling themselves? Yeah. But um, you know, that doesn't seem to be, you know, where we are. I mean, I, I think we're evolving as a as a species. Um, but you're talking about a real reactionary, um, reactionary forces. I mean, why does anybody care about a lot of things other people yeah. do with their okay. bodies? Well, we're speaking Uh, with Titus Peterson. He's a former lead felony prosecutor with Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Visit the website at leap.cc. And you mentioned the amount of money that comes into your office uh, doing prosecution uh, that have to do with both grants from the federal government to go after drug criminals and then the asset forfeiture that can be used to seize the the assets of, of alleged drug criminals, even without convicting them of a crime. Do you feel that that is deterring our efforts and retarding our efforts from fighting uh, uh, real crime, you know, theft, rape, arson, and so forth? Oh, for sure. I mean, it, it, it distracts people from uh, who work in law enforcement from being able to focus on real crimes. I mean, that that's clear. Uh, you know, you have to meet certain numbers. It's like any sort of business. When you're a prosecutor, you have to try a certain number of cases. Um, and, you know, some of the easiest cases to try are, you know, simple hippies who, you know, are probably the most like Jesus any, anybody you've <laughs> ever met, who get caught with some, you know, marijuana in their pocket. And there's not a big defense to that. And once you get past that, they were legally stopped and frisked under sort of, you know, what's happened with the Supreme Court. So you have to meet your numbers to get your grants. Mm-hmm. And so... 
that's a lot those cases are oftentimes a lot easier to to pursue than you know who's really breaking into these houses or you know who this um sort of serial rapist might be i mean those all involve a lot of footwork it's not simply you know let's stop somebody who looks like they might be using uh what's considered an illegal substance and then we just you know kind of paper up a reason to stop them and then we do this i mean you can meet your numbers a lot easier that way so and there is that aspect of seizing property i mean you know i have a client right now who's you know going to lose twenty four thousand dollars um and there's really nothing to be done about that. You just have to keep your mouth shut. And, and I honestly feel like even if you raise your voice about that, it's going to affect how you're treated in the rest of the criminal system. Sure. So, you know, there's a lot of sort of pressure coming back. I, I actually feel as if in Colorado, um, because we have dispensaries now and there's some ability to raise money legitimately um, out of the use of um, what I consider shamanic substances, um, that, that there's some ability to fight back, but otherwise the money is all on locking people up. I mean, there's money to be made there. It's a business model. And so, you know, when you don't have any ability to really address that and, and you have crazy people, um, I mean, that, you know, there's been so much indoctrination about all of this. I mean, we grew up watching like eggs fried and you know, pans on television, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like things that are just out and out lies that they've scared people to death. Yeah, with. This, this is your brain on drugs. To me, it kind of looks like breakfast, but okay, whatever. Uh, <laughs> hey, uh, Titus, we've got time for right? one last question here to, to wind right. up this segment. Uh, I just wanted to get some, you know, I was looking at your bio, and you know, one of the things our opponents always bring up when we talk about legalizing drugs is, oh, what about the children? So, can you tell us, as a prosecutor, as someone who's been in this system, what this war on drugs and the these grants and this policing do uh, as far as breaking up families? Yeah, I, th that was one of the most tragic things, I think, is that, you know, what happened, at least in the counties that I worked in, is that you funded actually drug officers, dare officers, to go in and speak to kids, and then they would tell kids how horrible these drugs were. And they would get the kids to basically narc on their parents with the idea, telling the kids that if they narked on their parents and told about what their parents would do, that they could help their parents. And then, of course, show them, you know, whatever was the version of the eggs frying in the <laughs> pan. So, so the kids would do that. Then social services would get involved. Then the kids would be taken out of the home, and then they'd be put in another home. And the parents then would have to, you know, prove that they weren't doing drugs or else they would be convicted and sent to prison. And it was, I mean, how disingenuous is that to have done that, to tear, tear people apart, to ruin children's lives uh, through this process? I mean, it, horrific. I mean, someday I think they'll read stories about this. It's, you know, it's like, you know, Charles Dickens sort of story. Somebody yeah. should write those stories about what goes on. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was horrific to watch this. And, and literally, there was little you could do because, you, you know, you had the prosecution side, you had the county attorney side. I mean, it was crazy, and, and the kids didn't know anything. I mean, they thought, here's a policeman, and probably their parents, because they were good parents, said, you know, if you're ever in trouble, you listen to the police, and you do all this stuff, and blah, 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 blah. Little did they know that they were going to end up, you know, basically having their lives destroyed and their children taken away. And mm -hmm. that that was probably one of the biggest tragedies I ever saw. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it happened repeatedly. Um, I'm not sure. I don't know to the extent it's happening now, because you know, I'm not involved with that, but that oh, was one is. of the things... We raise money for. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's still going on, and I'm, I'm telling you, Titus Peterson from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. We could uh, talk about that part of this uh, prohibition war for a long time, but I got to wrap up the segment. So uh, before we go, sure. if people want to get in touch with you or, or have you come down to uh, speak to them, uh, what's the best way to contact you? Um, best way is probably to call me at my office, which is 303-260-6412. That's my office. Uh, you know, I actually practice law in uh, Denver. Um, so, it, you know, call me at that or you can, um, yeah, that's probably the best place to go. Right. Or if you can send me a letter at 617th Street, Suite 2800, Denver, Colorado. So uh, that's the best way to get hold of me. And anybody who wants me to talk or talk to them or... 
um, share stories with uh, me, that would be terrific. So. All right, folks. This interview is available through podcast or at our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Radical Russ. So if you miss those numbers or address, you can go back and replay them and write them down and get in touch with Titus Peterson from Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. Visit the website at leap.cc. And uh, Titus, thanks for joining us here on the Russ Belva Show. We appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. The normal show. Because it's always smoking, matey. This is Normal Show Live. Don't touch that dial. Radical Russ and the Rolla J Studios crew will be right back after these messages. Uh, does internet radio even have a dial? Guys? Uh, this is the Russ Belleville Show. Marijuana and alcohol are the two most popular recreational drugs in America. Marijuana smoking is non-toxic, relatively safe, and has a low risk of dependence. Alcohol drinking is potentially fatal, dangerous to society, and is quite addictive. Marijuana is safer, so why are we driving people to drink? That's the question of the new book, Marijuana is Safer, So Why Are We Driving People to Drink? by Paul Armentano, Mason Tvert, and Steve Fox. Visit Amazon.com or ChelseaGreen.com today to order your copy of Marijuana is Safer or visit Marijuana is safer. The Russ Belleville Show, where we don't change our position on decriminalization in an election year. You want answers? I'm as bad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore. You want answers? You have offended my family. I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth. And you have offended Shaolin Temple. You can't handle the truth. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious. And don't call me Shirley. Hoorah! All right, folks, yesterday I told you a little bit about a post that was written by Chaz Pazienza on the Huffington Post marijuana section. You can find it by going to HuffingtonPost.com slash marijuana slash news, and it's in the blog sections on the left. And I, I replied to it, and he's actually replied to my reply. So we've got a bit of a dialogue going on here with Chaz Pazienza, uh, and I'll address that here in just a second. Now, let me get to uh, what the... the tone of his article was, it was basically saying that uh, those of us who are fighting for marijuana legalization need to get over ourselves. It's not the most important thing in the world. If you're basing your decision on who to vote for president on their stance on marijuana legalization, you're an idiot and that it's not as big a deal. You folks just want to get high. It's not really about, you know, all these other things. So I, I just wanted to address that because I am the epitome of the marijuana legalization movement that he's mocking and demeaning in this post. By the way, it's called Reefer Madness, if you want to look it up. He seems to think that those of us that are fighting for an end to the war on certain American citizens using non-pharmaceutical, non-alcoholic, tobacco-free drugs are just, you know, unabashed hedonists that we're hiding behind some lofty rhetoric to get our wacky tobacco legal so we can get doped up in peace. Let me quote to you from his piece, just a few relevant uh, pieces from uh, Ches Pazienza. A couple of weeks back, a couple of weeks back, though, Bob Cheska and I had a little debate going on on our podcast and radio show about the merits or lack thereof, in my opinion, of the culture of marijuana. You know, the movement full of people who basically take the diametrically opposed side of the argument to those who feel that pot is the devil's weed, mythologizing it rather than castigating it, claiming that it heals all wounds and has near magical properties that can be used in the service of mankind. If only the close-minded politicians would just give it a chance. Here's my issue with the marijuana culture, the <clears throat> fight to gain the national acceptance of pot, beyond the fact that a hell of a lot of people use it or have used it at one point in their lives. It's for the most part disingenuous. For God's sake, be honest about why you like weed. You like to get high. That hemp is beneficial to mankind and I need it as medicine horse shit is exactly that, horse shit. So 
<laughs> Pazienza goes to great lengths in this piece to actually indicate that he does want to see marijuana legalized. He accepts that it does have medicinal, medicinal properties and that hemp is an amazingly valuable crop for its myriad of industrial uses. He even posits that it's none of the government's damn business to police the habits of citizens so long as they're doing no harm to others. So why this vitriol toward those of us who are trying to get marijuana legalized? It seems to me that marijuana legalization is the only civil rights issue in America where it's still acceptable to mock the oppressed by questioning the selfish motives of those fighting for equality. Can you imagine the uproar if Pazienza were questioning the motives of those fighting for acceptance of equal marriage rights for gay people by observing, oh, you just like to get laid. And it's very likely nothing more noble than that. Admit it. Or, or, if cast, or, or, or if Pazienza had castigated a woman fighting for health insurance coverage of birth control by saying, oh, she just wants you and me and the taxpayers to pay her to have sex. Or imagine if Pazienza had demeaned those fighting against the English-only laws by saying, oh, they're just too lazy to learn English. Yes, indeed. Many people who support marijuana legalization just want to get high without having the police, clad in body armor and toting automatic weapons, breaking down their doors in the middle of the night, throwing flashbang grenades into their living room, and shooting seven times inside their homes, killing our family pets while our children are asleep in the next room. Gee, how disingenuous of them to want an end to all of that, just because they like to smoke weed. Now, certainly, many of the people that are getting their medical marijuana recommendations in California are doing so to treat arrest anxiety syndrome. Pazienza seems to think that, oh, California, you know, anyone can get a card, so what's the big deal? You know, why are you fighting all that? But really, who wouldn't take the opportunity to avoid arrest, incarceration, and seizure of their assets for the crime of choosing to get wasted on a drug whose advertisements don't fund Super Bowl telecasts and is far safer to use? But Pazienza seems to think that's the case in the other 16 medical marijuana states where, in fact, it takes a whole lot of medical documentation to qualify under an extremely limited set of medical conditions. Part of the reason that that medical use is limited in the 16 other states and forbidden in the rest is because people like Pazienza, who, who seem to understand the need to end prohibition, but they mock the people who are fighting for that important, necessary, and admirable work. Pazienza demands that legalization proponents abandon the larger societal points regarding the devastation of prohibition and base their arguments on the single selfish right to get high without government interference. Well, okay, Chez, you got me. I like the smoke pot and I don't want to be put in a cage over it. You're right. My motivation is extremely personal. Kind of like how a black man marching with Dr. King in the early 1960s probably had a very personal motivation to not be fire-hosed, attacked by police dogs, or lynched by rednecks. Probably like how a gay man protesting in the 1980s probably had a really personal motivation to not die from HIV while a president was ignoring the epidemic. Or even maybe like how a student is protesting with Occupy these days, and he probably doesn't have any big noble intentions of changing the world, but maybe he just wants to be at the center of some public civil disobedience just for the kicks of it. But regardless of the personal motivations, regardless of how it impacts you personally, that does not make the societal cause any less just or the people fighting for it any less noble. Whether you're the twirling hippie at the hemp fest for the high or the suit and tie activist at the hemp fest for the chance to organize voters, Standing up to fight injustice still carries the same personal consequences. Because I like to get high on marijuana, and I proclaim so openly, and I fight for the same rights that beer drinkers have, I'm going to be discriminated against in hiring, housing, and many other aspects of daily life. Few corporate employers are going to look past my dirty pee test because I happen to be cognizant of the greater devastation of global cannabis prohibition. To them, I'm just a guy who breaks the law and their drug-free workplace policy. Look, marijuana prohibition in America has contributed to the torturous murders of over 50,000 Mexicans and the terrorization and destabilization of Latin America. It is denied to our farmers our heritage crop of hemp that could ease many of the environmental and energy problems of this nation. It has contributed to the suffering of millions by denying them the safest therapeutically active substance known to man. 
It has enriched criminals, gangs, and terrorists, and imprisoned mothers and fathers whose only crime was choosing marijuana over martinis, Marlboros, or Midol. All these things are true, even if the tattooed Pierce dreadlock kid protesting at the marijuana march for a solution to it all just wants to get high. The right to one's own consciousness and to one's own self is the most personal of civil rights. This isn't about just getting high. This is about who has the jurisdiction over my brain and my body. If a woman has the right to do with her uterus as she pleases, why is it any less right for me to do with my brain and lungs what I choose? Look, whether the woman uses the morning after birth control pill because of an honest mistake and a sincere desire to prevent an unwelcome pre pregnancy, or because she's a careless nymphomaniac with six abortions in her past, that's irrelevant. We recognize she has a right to control her own body. So whether I'm fighting for my civil right to be as stoned as a beer drinker because I'm trying to commit police resources toward actual crimes, or because I simply prefer a marijuana buzz, it's irrelevant. I'm fighting for a just cause. Oh, and one final thought, Chez. You seem like a reasonable guy, so try to understand that what you see as the movement, when you see all the hippies and the tie-dye and the hemp fests and all that kind of stuff, what you're railing against, is really, railing against is really just the tip of the iceberg. There are 26 million people in America who will consume marijuana this year, about 17 million of them this month, about 2.5 million of them are consumers just like me and John who use marijuana almost every day. The movement that you see is the tip of the iceberg. The, the, the people who have nothing to lose by being out of the closet for ending marijuana prohibition. Either they're in the alternative crowd or they've got artistic jobs or low-wage jobs or professional jobs even that don't care about what is in their urine or what they're doing on the weekends. Or, or they're the professional activists like me whose job it is to be all about ending prohibition. What you don't see that's a, the biggest part of the movement is that silent majority who can lose their careers, their kids, their assets, their businesses, their friends, their family for espousing an end to this stupid war on drugs. Because they've got to be silent. They've got to be in the closet. They've got to be hidden for their own self-preservation. That's the most insane part of this, uh, this fight for our civil rights, this fight that we're all a part of, is the fact that being illegal makes it hard to change the laws. <laughs> it's really hard to change the laws that put you down when you get a felony and you lose your right to vote on that issue. You don't see that part of the movement, the people who are sincere, hardworking, tax-paying American citizens who don't, for 420, for them just means 40 more minutes at work, right? They're not the 420 crowd. They're not the tie-dyes and the, and the dreadlocks and the piercings and the tattoos. They're the average moms and dads, the workers, the teachers, the firefighters, the cops, the bankers, the business owners, the nuns and the fathers and the priests who can't mention that they want to see an end to marijuana prohibition. And furthermore, you assume that everybody who's fighting against this actually is fighting it for their personal want to get high. Sure, there's a lot of us that like to get high, but we were getting high already. We didn't have to tell anybody we were getting high. We didn't have to go out in public and sign petitions and, and put forth videos on YouTube and, and, and radio shows and all that. We didn't have to come out on the streets with big signs that say, I smoke pot and I like it all. We didn't have to do that. We were already getting high. We're already finding plenty of marijuana, already doing what we want to do. We didn't have to put our lives, our families, our reputations at risk to stand up for this. We're standing up for it because it's the right damn thing to do. And don't forget that there's a lot of people on our side, a lot of people, for example, law enforcement against prohibition, who've never taken a drug in their life, who've never even drank alcohol in their life. People like uh, the comedian and, and magician Penn Gillette, who's never used a substance in his life, but still recognizes the futility of trying to stop adults from doing what they want to do so long as they're not harming others. We're going to continue this conversation hour two in Toker Talk Radio. I got plenty more to say because Chez Pazienza actually replied to me. I'll give you some of his reply and then some of my retort to that. Coming up in Toker Talk Radio, hour 
two of the Russ Belleville Show, available as a subscription podcast. Just visit ttr.radicalrust.com for hour two. Or if you're just listening live, stay tuned. We're back with more right after this. For Ganja John and Cannabis Carry, I'm Radical Russ. Thanks for joining us. Until next time, take care of each other, tokers. This is the Russ Belleville Show. The Russ Belleville Show is blogging and podcasting daily at RadicalRuss.com. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it. You take a seed, you plant it, you grow it, you try it, you roll it, you smoke it, and it goes down smooth. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a frightfully sad song. I want to warn you in advance. So get those hankies and sponges at ready. It's 5 o'clock in the Pacific Time Zone.